walking the tightrope of dual role, and you're going to hear from Joe, who's experienced it, Johnny, who's experienced it, and Tracy, who experienced it. So they've got some real life stories to tell you about it. We're going to do a little bit of group work about what's actually happening. You know, when you listen to those stories, be thinking about what's happening here, what's going on, why is this an example of dual role? I'm going to talk a little bit about the research we published on dual role. Then we're going to do some more group work about, so if this stuff comes up, what can we do? And we'll just have a little bit of concluding sort of feedback at the end. So we're going to rip straight into this idea of walking the tightrope. And I think, Joe, you're going to speak go first. first. Is that right? So is your presentation the one that's on yes. here? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about my experiences while I was working as a clinical coordinator for a randomised control trial. Many of you will have heard a lot about SCIFA, um, the Spinal Cord Injury and Physical Activity uh, Randomised Control Trials. Um, the two that I'm specifically focusing on today are Switch On and Full On. So Full On was a randomised control trial comparing treadmill training training and FES cycling against an upper limb gym program and switch on was comparing passive cycling and FES cycling in patients with spinal cord injury starting within three weeks of their injury. So I had two ro distinct roles within the project. Um, first of all a therapy role, I trained the therapists um, that were doing the intervention and was the star backup covering for sick people not being able to make it. So I did quite a lot of the interventions. And I was also working as a physiotherapist occasionally on the spinal unit at the same time. From a research point of view, I was coordinating the study. So I was recruiting patients, contacting patients, organizing appointments, and often going um, with them when they were having their assessments. And at the same time, I was doing my PhD. And that complicated things slightly because some of the skipper participants were also my PhD participants. So some of the things that made it difficult, um, as I mentioned, I was coordinating and treating on the project. The project occurred in the um, at Burwood Hospital, both on the ward and in the spinal unit. And we used BSU staff as, as the research assistants, which they did outside their normal CDHB hours. We also had non-qualified staff that were working alongside the physio give, physios giving the intervention on the Skipper Full On program. And from my point of view, I was therefore consenting my previous patients, my current patients, and also patients that had been recently injured. And sometimes they were as little as two days post their initial injury when I was arriving on the ward to see if they wanted to take part in our wonderful research project. So some of the things um, <coughs> that happened along the way is for the Skipper Full On project, patients had to give up all of their sporting activities for the duration of the study. And for many of them, they were playing sort of social or semi-competitive wheelchair basketball or wheelchair rugby. And I had to tell them that they had to give that up if they wanted to be in the trial. And one of the participants said to me, oh, well, that's all right. I know I'm not meant to play sports, so I just won't mention it. And then the other thing was, it's all right, because if I get into the control group, I'll just withdraw from the study completely. Um, and Consenting the patients for switch on, who I said were just a couple of days post injury, I'd arrive on the ward and one of them said, oh, is that the study that the doctor told me I should do? And one of them even turned around and said to me, so do you think I should take part in this study? <laughs> During the, the switch on trial, when patients were having um, intervention after hours with the same physio that was treating them on the ward, I got asked, well, why can't I just do the cycling in the gym with my physio during my normal treatment time? One of the outcome measures asked patients' ability to walk upstairs. Obviously, these were often my current patients or previous patients, and they're looking at me and saying, but you know I can't walk upstairs. <laughs> when I was doing um, the full on, uh, the switch on intervention, I'd done my on call rushed in to start the training with someone and a patient in the in the bed next door that I treated in the gym earlier in the week was having trouble with the transfer and said, can you just help me with this transfer? And doing full on in the gym, um, 
one of the physios, can you give me a hand transferring this patient? And a lot of the patients did really well on the trial. They felt they were doing well, they were making good functional gains. And so towards the end of the trial, I had, well, can I still come in and use the FES bike? Because, uh, you know, it's really great and I'm really enjoying it and I'm getting lots of benefit. In fact, can you write to my case manager and tell her I need an FES bike now? Or can you get me a referral for some more physio now? Because I've made some really good progress and I'm up on my feet and I haven't been up on my feet for years. And I could go on, but I will leave it at that point and hand over to Tracy. <laughs> Well, good. So I am talking about uh, my role within qualitative research um, and my dual role experience. It's thinking. Thanks, Joe. Hey, nice slides. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, good. <laughs> All good. So. Um, basically for me, um, I have held several positions in the spinal unit over the last 15 years. Um, I have been a physiotherapist, uh, I've been a registry pilot coordinator for a study that we did in 2014-2015, and I'm now currently the uh, BSU New Zealand Spinal Cord Injury Registry uh, Coordinator. So this is how it's affected me. So in 2014 there was no national spinal cord impairment uh, registry at all in New Zealand and it hadn't been, been discussed for many years. We had a pilot project here um, which I was the coordinator for and we tried to establish international registries to see which would fit best here in uh, Burwood and in Auckland. Um, I was employed as the coordinator and then my masters was born. Something to do with the bail mob thinking that this is a good idea. Um, so it was the perfect chance for me to do my masters and these were my objectives to look at clinic, clinic, clinicians, staff perceptions of and understandings of registries and what factors influence staff entering data into a registry. So I did some focus groups and a while one interview. So the issues that I came up with um, recruiting fellow staff members, um, finding a time to suit all participants, challenging in the clinical world um, with very busy participants, trying to get good focus group dynamics, um, junior and senior members within the same staff, uh, within the same focus group can make for some interesting discussions. Um, these are some of the, the quotes from my uh, mine, are we able to add to the data we're collecting in the registry or is it fixed? So this was the issue for me being a clinician, um, being a coordinator, but researching. Um, I found this quite challenging. Are we having to legally for ACC do the FIM? So why is that information not being put into the registry? What do you think, Tracy? Do you remember when we had that two hour sit down during one person's entry, mm -hmm. which was in a different role? Uh, because you sent me the link, I don't even remember getting that email. You're asking me five minutes between emails or between clients to think deep about meaningful things I want answered. So this is just some of the feedback. Um, my phrasing and wording I found <laughs> influenced um, some things. So. I initially started with a negative tone, um, almost apologetic for having them in the room with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. It's like I was desperate to get them there. Um, so that was interesting. Uh, and I found it very hard to be an outsider because I'd been interwoven with this process for some time. Um, and it was quite personal for me. And then obviously the, what Jane was suggesting, ongoing work with colleagues, after the focus group concluded, discussions with staff for me as a coordinator versus a researcher and confidentiality were all things that crept up 
You have to stick your tongue out because it helps. So matching it. Um, I've got a slightly different story and perspective I'm not a clinician um, my experience is about researching people the same as Kevin uh, as, as me but it still leads to similar things um, in terms of my background I've got 11 years experience or 11 and a half years experience of living with spinal cord injury Five goes fast. Um, so, what have I done in that 11 years? Well, I'm not going to tell you everything. But I've, done <laughs> <laughs> I've done some traveling, I've done some work, I've had a family, I've faced secondary complications of spinal cord injury, I've faced some challenges, and I've undergone some education. Specifically, uh, six years of, of research experience altogether. I've done, done a master's degree. These are the two projects I'll, I'll talk about today. Uh, to understand how people with tetraplegia experience rehabilitation. And a PhD to understand wheelchair users' experience of community inclusion in the four years post-earthquakes. The PhD was a mixed method study, but today I'll just specifically be talking about the qualitative aspects of it. So what's the difference between living with spinal cord injury and researching with spinal cord injury? Well, living with spinal cord injury, obviously you develop certain assumptions and views through your personal experience. And another thing I've found, and I'm sure Claire and Richard will speak to this as well, is that when you meet or interact with other people with spinal cord injury, you kind of can engage in quite vigorous conversations about everything spinal cord injury. Advice, oh, have you traveled there? And, oh, have you got this complication? How did you deal with that? What's the best way to drain a leg back on an airplane? What's the best place to stay at? Are those pills, do they dry your mouth out, etc, etc. So you're constantly sharing information and sharing experience. However, when you're researching, of course, you're meant to be following these principles. Uh, <laughs> listening, empathizing, exploring, prompting, and interpreting all at once. <laughs> Much like marriage, really. <laughs> uh, so, when I am researching with my peers, I am. Um, have similar things going on, apart from just having the spinal cord injury. For example, in my masters, I had a very similar level <coughs> to the participants that went through the spinal unit. And I also went through the same service, so I was asking them questions about the service that I also went through. And with the PhD, it seems very <laughs> obvious, but I live in Christchurch, I experienced some of the earthquakes, um, and I use a wheelchair. So when I when I explain the issues, I, I need to be careful not to go beyond this yes. because that's what we're going to discuss. <laughs> but these are the sort of uh, comments that I got, um, and they're a mixture of, of masters, research, and PhD as well. Our sort of injuries, disabled people like you and I, people like us. The education was poor. Don't don't you think? And this next one really speaks for itself. Do you have any ideas? Now I'm going to turn the whole situation around and interview you. Uh, that's a real crucial point, uh, John, to put into your report. Uh, so they're just a few quotes just to um, add to the discussion as well. Cheers. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, John.
go through the donation because it's also technical, <laughs> as you can tell. Adding it to my CV. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is we're actually going to do some group work. So Sandy and Philip up the back, if you would like to join a table, that would be great. Um, because what we're going to, to do now, slide uh, first. What we're going to do now is engage in some small group discussion about what was going on in those three different groups of, of uh, real life experiences of dual role. This is like a yeah. cool. Yes, you've got a mirror, you've got a mirror of the thing. Okay. So we're going to spend about 15 minutes on this. And I'll, what I want you to be thinking about in your groups as you talk together is you can focus on just something Joe said, just something Johnny said, just something Tracy said. You can think more broadly than that. You can consider all of the stories if you like. But think about what you've heard and you'll add to it your own experience. I'm sure that one part of the reason you're here is most of you know this because it's happened to you already. And so draw on your own experience as well to think about what's going on when you experience that feeling of, oh, am I, have I got my foot in this camp or have I got my foot in this camp? Or does my participant think I've got my foot in this camp or I've got my foot in this camp? So think about that feeling, think about what precipitated it, what was going on when that happened. Some of the things that might help you think about what was going on are who are the people involved and what roles or identities are they bringing to the encounter? What, was, what were you actually doing at the time? There might have been something about the conversation or something about being in the gym or something about that that um, was precipitating that feeling. Also, you might want to think about when in the life cycle of the research did this actually happen? Was it something you were thinking about when you were planning and thinking about, oh, crikey, how am I going to manage this? Or was it something that happened to you maybe after you went back to the clinical setting after being a researcher and the person who was the participant comes along and says, oh, it's you. Oh, I hadn't realised. Oh. And then you realise that they hadn't realised that you were in both places and they've got to work out now who are you this time. Um, what was the ethical or methodological thing that concerned you? What were you worrying about? So these things might help you think about what was precipitating that feeling of dual role. You've got some post-it notes there. Um, and so what we'd like you to do is write on the post-it note, one post-it note for each of these things we're calling a catalyst. What was going on? What was the thing that was happening um, that brought up this feeling of dual role? So one post-it note per catalyst. Um, or the ethical concern or the methodological concern. Go for it, 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Just in case you haven't memorised the entire party. I'm just going to take those words and I'm going to find a man to say to my Johnny from the person who's not going to have a marriage. I know, I don't know. Let's just stop there. Just like marriage. Let's go back home. Teach her. So, yeah. 